Well, we won't start with that yet. Again, in five, four, three, two, one. We can all stand for the invocation. <clears throat> Lord bless this meeting tonight. Uh, the gathering that we have here of Canby citizens to uh, um, talk about our planning for the, the future of Canby. Um, take a moment to uh, have silence for the police officers that fell here over the over the last weekend and uh, and pray for their souls and their families give us a good meeting tonight Lord and uh, and we get everybody home safely thank you amen Oops. sorry <laughs> I pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the first thing we'll call for is uh, citizen input on non-agenda items. Anybody here want to speak to uh, something that is a non-agenda item? Okay. Uh, minutes from the meeting of May 9th. I had a chance to read those. I will accept a motion to... Mr. Chair, I would like to move that we accept the minutes for May 9th. I have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we are now going to hear, consider a request for a site and design review for a proposed multi-tenant commercial building, DR 16-03, Mr. Tom Scott. Let's start with that one. I will read the uh, quasi-judicial public hearing script. The matter presently before the hearing body requires a public hearing. All interested persons in attendance shall be heard on the matter. If you wish to testify on this matter, please be prepared to step forward to the microphone at the appropriate time. State your name, mailing address, and interest in the matter. For those people other than the applicant that are interested in testifying as either proponents or opponents, please sign in on the sheet or speak up when we call for testimony. For longer presentations, proponents and opponents may buy time from one another. In so doing, those either in favor or opposed may allocate their time to a spokesperson who will represent the entire group. Your time, you may be limited by time for your presentation. Generally, the applicant will have a total of 15 minutes to speak. The proponents will be given five minutes each. The opponents will be given five minutes each. And those thought to be neutral on the matter will be given five minutes each. The applicant will then have 10 minutes for a rebuttal. All questions must be directed through the chair. Any evidence to be considered must be submitted to the hearing body for public access and to become a part of the record. All written testimony received both for and against prior to the hearing shall be summarized by staff and presented briefly to the hearing body during the staff report. Testimony and evidence must be directed toward the applicable review criteria contained as indicated in the staff report, the comprehensive plan or the applicable land use regulations which the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government to respond to the issue may preclude an action for damages in circuit court. Everyone present is encouraged to testify, even if it is only to concur with previous testimony. At this time, I would ask that any member of the hearing body who has a conflict of interest to please indicate the nature and extent of the conflict and whether you intend to participate in or abstain from the hearing, uh, from hearing the present matter. 
Uh, oh, we're all good there. Ex parte contact. If any member of the hearing body has had any ex parte contact with anyone prior to this hearing, including a visit to the site, please declare the nature and extent of such contact at this time. I work on Southwest Second, so I drive by the site every day. Other than that, yeah. Yeah. So a drive-by site. Drive yes. Okay. I've been watching it for a while. Then. Yep. There you go. <laughs> um, the public hearing will be conducted as follows. First, we have the staff report, and then questions by the hearing body. Then we will have the applicant again, not more than 15 minutes. <clears throat> Then the proponents, not more than five minutes each. Opponents, not more than five minutes each. Neutral, not more than five minutes each. And the rebuttal by applicant, not more than 10 minutes. At that time, we will close public testimony, and then there will be questions, if any, by the hearing body. We'll have discussion and deliberation, and uh, no additional testimony at that time. The decision shall be made by the hearing body at the close of the hearing, or the matter will be continued to a date certain in the future. This will be the only notice of that date you will receive. Does anyone have any questions about the procedure? The okay. um, Brian. Thank you, Chair Savory. <coughs> good, good evening, Commissioners. Good to see you all again. It's been a while. Uh, this application is a site and design review. It's a type three application that requires planning commission public hearing and review, the reason you're here. Uh, <clears throat> the project is located on 851 Southwest First Avenue, which is right adjacent to Burgerville and Taco Bell on the other side. And uh, in working out very early on at the pre-application meeting, uh, they had uh, solved an existing issue with the driveway off of 99E and that it was a common driveway with Burgerville. In fact, some of their people that would drive up to the uh, drive up window would then pull away from the window and park parallel to the highway, halfway on this site and halfway on uh, their own site. Uh, there's, I, my understanding is that uh, some of the customers of Burgerville have been parking on this site, and I imagine that will not continue once this is developed and will be their own code enforcement issue to uh, relegate those people to adequate parking by minimum ordinance requirements that are actually on the Burgerville site itself. But that uh, driveway on Burgerville then becomes just an exit driveway from their drive up window. And then very nearby is this two way driveway that comes in off of uh, the, the highway. And they did do a traffic study. Uh, it was a fairly extensive traffic study. Usually that's the case when you're uh, on a development that's on ODOT controlled highway. And so they participated and were a part of that traffic study uh, throughout. Uh, we did not include the entire study in your packet. I did send you an email indicating that if you needed to, it was on our city's website so you could look at it. Um, but since I'm talking about that, I think I'll just finish talking about the traffic study. Uh, the recommendations that were in the executive summary are simply a, a common one to keep the site uh, distances at that highway driveway. And for that matter, at the uh, southern driveway that's on to uh, 4th Avenue there, clear of any obstructions. So that means uh, landscaping has to be low and uh, you try to keep parking spaces out of those areas and so that you can see up and down the highway uh, several hundred feet in order to see people coming when you're trying to turn right or left out of that driveway. And there wasn't any indication that there was going to be any problems with that site distance. The um, deliveries of large trucks, it's recommended that uh, they be kept off peak hours because uh, one thing you'll find out in review of the site plan is they do not plan any particular loading zone uh, for these small type tenants in a site like this. It's been a fairly common 
thing. In fact, the last one that I believe you reviewed was in Canby Square, where we had four tenants in that particular redevelopment of the former Hoi Tin restaurant site. Uh, you actually waived the, uh, on the uh, loading zone uh, for that particular one. So you may want to ask about what they expect deliveries and those kind of things to be. But, the traffic study said uh, it should be okay if they're not blocking all of their own parking spots when the loading trucks are there, and that works pretty good if they're aware of that for themselves and they have the loading done during the off hours. So that's what that's related to. And then uh, the applicant's prepared to show you a revised site plan. And I laid a copy of the, the revised site plan on your dais, but uh, uh, he apparently got a, a picture of the original and uh, one on the board behind me uh, that shows the new proposed site plan. And the, and the biggest difference in them is that they lost two parking spaces at the entrance off of Highway 99E. It was part of the traffic studies uh, recommendation that those spaces are so close to the driveway when someone backs out, they're gonna be in conflict with somebody turning right into the site and the safety issue right there. And it's not only that safety issue, it's the fact that normally when you have a fairly busy site, you want what they call throat distance. That's a stacking distance so that cars don't back up turning into a site on the highway and get rear-ended because they couldn't get into the site. And so you want that stacking distance. Well, two elimination of two parking spots is gonna help with that stacking distance. So there's less likelihood that somebody is going to back up into the highway when they slow down to get into this uh, particular facility. Uh, so I, th I think that was a good recommendation and the applicants already responded with a revised plan uh, and I think they'll explain that further. The other thing that was mentioned in the traffic study was uh, they needed seven bicycle parking spaces rather than five that were originally shown. So my understanding is they correct that deficiency as well. The uh, The building indicates it's about 6,109 square feet. Uh, the final design shows four different tenants. And I'll just let the applicant uh, explain whether they're ready at this point to divulge who or what they may be, but uh, basically retail uh, for traffic purposes and such. The uh, what else is important in here they uh, in their parking they took advantage I guess or at least indicated that they qualify for a reduction in the minimum required parking spaces based upon the fact that uh, primarily that they have a unique situation with having the high school directly across the street. And that means that a great deal of their traffic actually can be and will be pedestrian oriented coming to the site. So the code does provide an opportunity to reduce required parking by 10%. Um, I think they might have taken advantage of one or two parking spaces in that reduction due to losing those at the entrance uh, before they had the minimum required without the need to take advantage of that. Uh, I thought I'd point that out. Sometimes uh, applicants want more than the minimum parking because, uh, and that's something that you should be aware of is that our codes are just for minimums. They don't say what necessarily they may actually need in their own terms. There is a couple <coughs> uh, ordinance requirements that were pointed out in the staff report that they don't actually meet. And uh, this may be the third 
or fourth that has been in front of you that hasn't met these similar requirements, the latest being in the Canby Square. Uh, they have to do with the fact that this is in the downtown Canby Overlay District and it's in the outer highway commercial sub area. And one of the purpose statements of that sub area is to accommodate vehicular oriented uses. Yet some of the standards are somewhat similar to downtown, it is the downtown overlay, standards that talk about building buildings all the way up to the street. And what we have found in the previous three uses is that they tend to want to build automobile oriented developments that have drive up windows and they almost always need to go in front parallel up at the street which results in the building being set back further than what the minimum requirement is to have it close and so that's one of the areas that it is deficient in <coughs> another one has to do with the floor area ratio I think they're at about um, 0.18. The minimum requirement is 0.25. And what they would have to do to meet the standard is build a two-story building. And so, uh, I'm trying to think if the McDonald's building met that now. I can't remember if they actually did or not. But when you're trying to provide the minimum parking requirements, meaning you need quite a bit of parking area, uh, then you have trouble building two-story buildings or it's not common in this kind of retail. It's very uncommon to see two-story buildings uh, with this kind of retail uses. And so that's something that uh, I'm just pointing out again and mentioning the fact that uh, we've faced this and you have faced this in previous uh, things and so at some point we may need to look at the design standards in the uh, outer highway commercial sub area because we seem to have a pattern going here in that it's very difficult for people to comply with all of those uh, standards that are similar to what the downtown core commercial areas where we definitely want buildings up to the uh, street and such. So, and it seems like it's a little bit uh, in conflict with the purpose statements because uh, they want to encourage these automobile uses, but yet the standards aren't really allowing that. We had the same problem with Fred Meyer fuel station. The uh, Applicant's going to show you uh, the uh, appearance of this building, and staff was quite pleased with uh, the way this looks. And it's always more so when you think of the existing buildings that were on the site that were cleared before this. And so uh, this is certainly is going to be quite an upgrade to this part of the highway frontage. And, uh, but regardless of that, it's a nice looking uh, building and kind of a unique uh, tenant mix that's going in there. They have to address the outdoor lighting standards and have managed to do that just fine with uh, their proposal. And I think that's really the main issues. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the, the list of uh, conditions of approval, I'd be happy to answer anything about those at this time or when you're in, in discussion about it. Any questions? Uh, I have one just out of curiosity. Why is there uh, driving on the, uh, I guess it would be the east side of the building? Um, what was the uh, reason for that, do you know? Well, it was most likely related to just where their existing driveway on the highway uh, was. They're relocating the driveway that's down on the uh, south part of the site that was in the middle of the site. 
but when you lay out the the parking lot, try to get it to function, and try to get the stacking capacity behind a drive-up window, all those things play a part in how it all falls together. And so I don't know, I, I'm guessing that it didn't work with because of the driveway off the highway being a set deeded driveway that they wanted to take advantage of and not ask for a relocated driveway from ODOT. And so pro that probably said, hey, the building's got to go on the other side. And, and thus the drive up window where it had to be. It just needed to be a little more homey if the, ho the tenants had a little space. Yeah, I think it's all based upon that ODOT driveway that came with the deed of the property when it was purchased. Any more questions for Brian? Okay. <clears throat> then we'll move on to uh, uh, the uh, public hearing. So who's going to speak for the applicant? If you'll uh, step up, <coughs> sign in, state your name and address. Okay, I've already signed in. Can okay. you hear me okay? I can hear you now. Good evening. My name is Scott Beck, an architect, 361 Northeast 3rd Avenue, Canby. And uh, I'm here representing uh, the client's wishes and the project design. Um, and what we're looking at is a mixed use, you know, highway oriented uh, commercial project. And uh, as Brian stated, it's uh, the CM uh, zone with the outer highway commercial overlay. And uh, some of the project goals for the design were to create a project that uh, you know has visibility and curb appeal uh, relating to the highway, um, also providing some pedestrian friendly connections and taking advantage of the fact that the high school is nearby. Um, fairly broad uh, sidewalks along Fourth Avenue and, and just the benefits of having them as a neighbor. Um, also. Uh, the site is set up to where it's visible uh, from all four sides. So oftentimes you'll have a building that has one good face and you know maybe the back faces an alley or something. In this case, the project's quite visible, so we had to respect the fact that uh, all sides are gonna be viewed and you needed to take some care with the design. Um, the, the other thing was the, uh, the highest and best use for the site at, at this time, you know, based upon market analysis and uh, current trends of development, were to uh, be able to accommodate a drive-up window. And in order to have that, you have to have a, uh, you know, a drive-up aisle that you can queue up a certain number of cars. I think the code requires a minimum of eight. And so, in order to um, provide that type of facility on site, you do have to segregate your parking, you know, um, two-way parking aisles and your drive up in, you know, separate and parallel fashion so you don't have a conflict. And so that's really the, the driving force. Um, the existing driveway off 99E is actually, we're, we're looking to relocate it slightly to the west. I don't recall the exact uh, amount, but we've had discussions with ODOT. There was some benefit in doing so uh, to align better with the, uh, the access on 4th Street. It made for a lot cleaner um, traffic pattern through the site. I think we're moving it maybe you know, 10 to 15 feet, something of a nature, but we're in the process of reviewing that. They were, um, you know, in favor of, of that kind of a shift. And uh, so that is in the works as we speak. Um, another goal was to make the building, you know, compatible with the adjacent neighborhood, but still have, you know, an individual identity uh, and a sense of place. So that was a, one of our goals as well. Um, the project is uh, 6,109 square feet. Uh, the basic building is 60 by 104. Um, and the expected tenants will be a couple of uh, food related tenants, possibly a sandwich shop or a, a set down pizza restaurant. And then the balance would be retail. Um, the, the northerly and southerly tenants uh, have 
facades that you know allow for glass on two sides. Those would probably be the restaurant type tenants with the retail in the center. Um, so the site design again uh, has two-way access from uh, 99E to Fourth Avenue. Um, we're proposing a broad pedestrian walkway in front of the building. Um, it's nine foot eight at the narrowest portion along the north and 12 feet to the south. Um, that should allow for the possibility of having some outdoor bistro tables when the weather's decent. Um, there's also space for some uh, benches, things of that nature. So, so part of the uh, discussion about parking, when we initially calculated the parking, we were looking at maybe 5,000 square feet of the 6,100 with the potential of being restaurant oriented. Um, since then, we've you know backed away from that. However, it would be nice to be able to maintain um, the ability to do that in the future. And so we would like to go ahead and, and take advantage of the allowed 10% reduction uh, by virtue of the fact that we're near the high school and that we are able to provide uh, a pedestrian-oriented development with some extra wide sidewalks, the seating, things of that nature that are, uh, make up the criteria to allow for acceptance of that reduction. So even though with the current proposal, we don't need the reduction in parking, we would like to go ahead and, and uh, get that approved at this time for future flexibility. Um, the site plan up here that was colored represents the initial design that was submitted to you. Um, after the fact, I think just this last week, we were given a copy of the DKS traffic study, and in there they made the recommendations that Brian had discussed. Um, they wanted to eliminate the first two upper left stalls to provide uh, a greater throat for safety. Um, and they asked that we provide uh, seven bicycle stalls instead of the five. Right, right there, is that what you're talking That's about? That's correct. So if you, if you look, uh, those were two compact stalls. So the bottom one of the two, um, we came back and presented a revised site plan. You there's can't a read. Red, there's a pointer, red pointer thing there. All right, if here. you wanted to try to point to your. How's it work? It's got a red button on it that you press. Okay, so right here, this uppermost curb line represents that line right there where they asked that the two stalls go away. So in uh, reconfiguring it, it seemed odd to have one stall with a planter finger right next to it. So we went back and re we reevaluated based upon their recommendation this entire edge of parking. So in this design, we provide landscape to that line, and then um, eliminated one of the planter fingers here, went to a single one in the center, um, tightened up some of the compact stalls, and originally proposed like nine feet wide compact stalls here, and went back and changed them out to eight foot six. Um, went to the single planter finger in the center, and we were able to pick up one more compact stall down here adjacent to the trash enclosure. So the net effect was we lost one parking stall and we actually gained about 150 uh, square feet of landscape uh, to the overall site landscaping. Um, <clears throat> the original design had five bicycle stalls that were under cover at this location. We came back and added two more near the south entrance at this location. So that gave us the total of seven that was uh, recommended. Um, so these are the exterior elevations of the building and uh, what we're looking at is a contemporary architecture with flat parapet walls of uh, varying heights. Um, the building also has you know a fairly dominant cornice line and some of the key elements have a, a protruding cornice that uh, extends out about uh, 12 inches beyond the line of the building to give it you know some shadow lines and kind of a pronounced top and one of the goals of the design requirements is to have a building with a base a middle and a top and so in, in certain fashion we've done that with with a little bit more of a modern building um, 
Also, we're incorporating uh, distinct architectural elements to break up the mass of the building um, and utilizing different colored of materials and textures to do that. So we've got um, a red brick masonry kind of at the key uh, tenant storefronts. We have a little bit darker brick for an accent in those uh, wall planes. And then we have a, a split face masonry block, which is a, a dark gray color as the dominant color. Then there's an accent, which is a ground face, more of a smooth material, slightly lighter gray. And that lighter color is proposed on the east side at, at these panels and uh, also on the south. And then there, you can't really see it, but there are some accent courses here and here that utilize the lighter color. Um, other key features of the building are uh, a covered walkway. So this portion here, there are three column bays that provide an eight foot by about 50 foot long covered walk area, which is nice in the you know wet weather. And then also um, up here, this bicycle parking is covered with an eight foot by, I think it's 12 feet uh, metal canopy. You can see it right here. It's at the bottom of it's at 10 feet. And then likewise, these major facades have a protruding canopy that sticks out a couple feet. Um, it's fabricated steel, and then these are indented. So there's a brick column here and then a recessed storefront. So you end up with a, a shadow line of about five feet at those storefronts. So the combination of those separate you know, wall planes, the overhangs, um, should provide some interesting shadow lines and, and uh, they're functional as well with you know, providing weather protection. Um, also, the, the parapet walls are fairly tall. The, the flat roof line is down here. I think they're roughly six feet high, so they'll be plenty high to screen any rooftop equipment. You won't, won't see any of that from a distance. Um, and, and again, I think we've you know, made an effort, even on the back of the building, to give it a four-sided appearance. We've got some high windows um, here. This would be where the drive-through would stack up. This would be roughly the location of a drive-up window. And then we've added some fairly shallow awnings that just stick out a couple feet. So you know, trucks and things in the drive-up shouldn't run into them. And they do provide interest to the building and some natural light on the inside for the tenants. Um, so, as mentioned, the overall design of the building and site conform to all aspects of the code with four exceptions, and Brian had kind of touched on those. Um, the first of them has to do with the fact that we're proposing a setback greater than the 10-foot allowed in the outer highway commercial. Um, and it also asks for a 40% uh, facade frontage along that. And uh, so our frontage is roughly 155 feet. The building overall is 60 feet and then 68 feet. Um, so the uh, setback again you know in order to accommodate the drive up window we're only allowed the single access and so you're really forced to have to have your a loop around and that in and of itself that's 12 feet wide you need a landscape strip and then I need a an egress out of the building all of that added up to roughly 21 foot 8 inches so we're propo proposing a 21 foot 8 inch setback from 9090 property line frontage to the building facade and then some portions of the building are set back uh, a bit further. Back at this line, which is uh, 34 feet from the property line, we provide 43% facade relative to the overall frontage. And part of that is because in order to make the radius uh, at the drive up aisle, we had to notch the building back. And so that forced me to, to move parts of the building away from the street as well. Um, and, and again, it seems like there are some precedents with current, you know, recent development, uh, McDonald's, Canby Square, Walgreens, um, the Panda Express, all of those buildings appear to be set back uh, quite a bit further than 10 feet from the property line. And so that's why we uh, 
propose what we are. Um, the next item was again the floor area ratio. The code requires 25% uh, floor area to site ratio. We're proposing 18.5%, so we're uh, clearly under. Um, and again, in order to provide adequate landscaping, parking, um, you'd have to develop a two-story building on this site. And with the highway-oriented uh, development, the second story really, you know, it doesn't work out well. It doesn't lease up well. You've got to have an elevator. You've got to provide room for egress stairs. Um, with like the restaurant type tenants, which are very, you know, good tenants you'd expect along the highway. They have a lot of equipment on the roof, cooking exhaust fans, rooftop equipment. All of that's greatly complicated if you have to go through another floor to get to the roof. And so because of that, we're asking for relief from that 25% floor area ratio. Um, the third item was, uh, I believe along the highway, there's a requirement that there be a 15 foot landscape buffer to any um, parking and maneuvering or drive aisles. By getting rid of these two stalls and moving them down, we've eliminated that conflict, but we're still looking at a five and a half foot landscape setback to the edge of this drive aisle. So we're asking for relief from that requirement, uh, 15 feet down to five and a half feet. Um, and then the last item has to do with uh, the loading stall. The code requires for building of this size a 13 by 35 dedicated uh, loading stall. And uh, we're proposing roughly down in this location a 13 by 35 non-marked loading space. And the anticipation is that um, the type of tenants we're going to have here won't have bulky merchandise. Um, and any of their deliveries would be expected to be in off-peak hours. And so, you know, uh, evenings or early mornings. And don't anticipate any conflict with uh, traffic patterns and, and vehicle circulation on the site. Um, and again, it appears that other there is precedence where other development, recent development, um, McDonald's, the Starbucks building at Camby Square, neither of them uh, appear to have a dedicated um, loading berth. And so again, we're asking for uh, acceptance of, of uh, you know, a non-dedicated stall. Um, that's about all I have. I, I'd like to field any questions you might have about the design and site, the site and building. <clears throat> any questions? No. I'm just curious on the third. Um, yeah. Brian, can you tell me why that 15-foot landscape buffer is a requirement? Is it a safety uh, issue? He almost surprised me with that one, too, because it's not actually in our staff report. Uh, so he listed uh, if, if you divide out the 10-foot setback and the 40% of the building, there's actually five, I guess, and, and we've only identified four in our staff report. Uh, I guess I'd have to look it up again. You're saying there's a 15 foot and you're providing 5.5 feet? Correct. Yeah, I asked for relief from and four items. Right. Um, the 10 foot, min, you know, minimum. Um, the second one was... It, is it just a highway buffer so. requirement? Yeah. I think it asked that you not have parking or maneuvering uh, yeah. within 15 feet oh. of the highway frontage. And. Uh, I guess I've totally forgotten about that one. It's just kind of surprised me because I'm thinking about some of the others we've done, and, and certainly we didn't have that on the, the Fred Meyer fuel station, and you know what it went through with all the mm -hmm. Luba cases and had lots of scrutiny. Right. So I might, ex I might explain that process again is that the, one of the advantages, <coughs> some developers may not think there's an advantage, the advantage of the downtown overlay district is that you can actually have a type two review process, which bypasses the planning commission and staff can approve if they follow every single code requirement to the T. If they don't, then they come for you for some of that discretion. Uh, there's actually been some 
gray area on how much authority you have to waive some of these things, but we've taken a little <coughs> bit broader approach over time and said that you can uh, consider waiving both the development standards and the design standards. Uh, there has been some argument that it's very clear that you can waive and substitute alternatives for all the design standards. Anything that has to do with the appearance and the colors and those kind of things, there's some question about how far you should be going in waiving the actual development standards. But and since that isn't that clear, that's another thing maybe we should make it clear that you can because we have been and that seems to be a, a a friendlier and more flexible approach because of the uniqueness of some of these properties we've been doing so i just thought i'd point that out that that you have that authority to to do that more power yeah <laughs> I think that the, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. One more question. Has the fire marshal reviewed all of this and yet? Uh, I don't I don't believe they have. Um, I don't think there's anything. We are planning to fire sprinkle the building, which is a big advantage. That's a big um, That simplifies a lot of, you know, things with the construction of the building. They highly uh, appreciate that. It's not a large enough building where it's, you know, outright required, but there are advantages to doing so. Um, so I don't anticipate he'll have any problems. We've got good a access to the site. They've got good hose lay lengths. Um, there are hydrants nearby, and the fact that we're sprinkling goes a long ways. Now, we didn't get any particular comments back, uh, but they've had an opportunity at the pre-app, and we asked for comments again for this. and. Uh, although a lot of times we're so busy now, we haven't been able to follow up for every single one if they haven't commented. And so we kind of make an assumption that they're okay when they don't comment. But there is one more chance at the construction stage for the fire department if they have any final uh, concerns. But uh, Scott's right in that with sprinkled system, they usually don't have much of a problem and when there's good access in and out of the site. I have to admit, I'm kind of surprised that the, uh, <clears throat> some of the proposed uh, deviations from the required standards that from, for the buffer uh, 15 feet down to 5.5, uh, far requirement from 25% down to 18.5%, and then the frontage setback from more than 50%. Those are maybe you can. Um, I mean, I see the reasoning for it. It's just. Uh, well, I, you know, I I don't know about, for instance, McDonald's, but I suspect they may not have met those requirements either. I, I don't know that for a fact at all. Um, j just the reality of developing that piece of property where it's at, um, with the current marketplace and and. Uh, you know, it doesn't completely correspond with the letter of the code. I did my very best without, you know, really taking away from the value of their project to meet the code. And I've done it in the past where we've met everything up front. We didn't have to go to hearing. But sometimes you have to, you know, um, do your best and still come forward and, and offer up arguments uh, for, your, for your consideration. Yeah. Sometimes reality does intrude on yeah. put on a canary pad so yeah we you know we do have uh, plenty of lands we're over on landscaping um, we have all the buffers elsewhere it was just that that one for whatever reason they wanted a larger buffer between the highway and parking or maneuvering and again we got rid of the parking by eliminating the couple stalls but I cannot you know, I'm trying to keep the building as close as I can, but yet provide the uh, drive aisle. We're kind of caught between the two of them, and that's where we're at. <coughs> Any more questions, observations? Well, on that right there, I know that we, we waived that in two projects that, right off the bat that I can think of, because it was so, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't work. 
we need that drive aisle, and especially the drive through over at Starbucks. Right. They, that we just put in, I and mean, that was, it's right on top of the, there's barely any landscape there, so. And the Fred Meyer fuel station is the same thing. Right. I'm guessing part of that requirement may have to do with uh, the entrance off the highway, the driveway itself, this throat distance and stacking distance. They figured if they didn't have maneuvering that close to the highway, there would be a little more distance for you to pull off before you encountered on-site problems that would back you up into the highway. But I don't know. I don't really know why that requirement is a little more strict on the front area. Okay. And I'd forgotten about it. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no more questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any any more proponents? <coughs> State your name and address. And uh, Tom Scott, uh, 130 Southwest Second okay. Avenue, Camby. I am uh, represent the family that owns the property. Uh, we bought this property. Um, uh, about uh, eight months ago. As you may remember, it burnt down or had a severe fire in about May of 2015 um, and to the point where it was it was going to be tough to repair. Um, so we contacted the property owner and uh, uh, were able to work out a deal. And so we bought it really with no plans um, on what to do. We just thought, saw, it, saw it as an opportunity to uh, um, as a future development and hopefully improve our city. Um, so we began a market analysis of what we might be able to do with it. Uh, with Scott and Pat uh, Sissel, we probably went through 30 or 40 um, different concepts. And when you do that, you learn a lot about your site, your restrictions, um, you know, the, the things that you're going to be fighting along the way. Um, you're, you're reading the code and trying to, trying to meet all those things. But uh, as, you, as you well know, it's not always easy to do that. And that's what we found out. And so, believe me, we looked at this thing in uh, tons of different ways um, without even thinking about a tenant mix, just what we could do with the site. And this is really where we landed on. And <clears throat> this works out both in a, a, a marketable standpoint, uh, where we could put a good tenant mix that will uh, be support, we think, will be supported by the community and functionality uh, long term. Uh, we do have two national tenants um, ready to sign leases for the building, one regional tenant, and currently have one vacancy um, that we have about three or four tenants interested in, and would expect to have that filled probably in the next couple of months. Um, I do want to point out that we do have um, a deeded access to the property. Uh, we are asking to move that, and ODOT supports that move verbally. Obviously, we're going through a process to get that approved, and that's what you see here. So the, the access that you see when you drive by would be moved about uh, 12 or 15 feet um, to the west um, on that paper there. And then we would obviously get rid of the uh, access next to the uh, Taco Bell site. Are you talking about this right here? Correct. So we moved it towards Burgerville about 12 or 15 feet. And there's a process with ODOT that's not very cumbersome. Uh, it's a pretty uh, relatively easy approval process, and they've said they support that. So, um, the setback reduction that we're asking for, uh, again, I, I want to go back to you talking about you studying your site and seeing what you can do with it. Obviously, that in this kind of a development, the location, um, a drive-up window is important. Um, the way our world works today, um, um, desirability for tenants and for them to be successful, which we all want to happen, um, that's important. Um, and so part of our issue was is trying to figure out how we get a drive-through on this site because it's a fairly narrow site. Um, get the access uh, that we have the right to uh, from ODOT. Uh, and get the cars out to uh, the highway in a safe manner. ODOT, we knew, would not support having two egresses like Burgerville does now, where they have a drive-through in the back and they have an egress on the other side of the building. We knew that would probably not be supported uh, by ODOT um, in today's day and age. So we had to figure out a way to loop around the building, and this is what we came up with. Um, and yeah, we don't meet the setback, but we will be probably one of the closer buildings along that highway frontage. As I look at uh, the Starbucks building, the newer one down by Safeway, um, 
the Walgreens and the other ones across the street, uh, McDonald's, which has just finished up, all the muffler shops, the Taco Bells, all that stuff, I think our building will end up, Burgerville might be about comparable to us. Um, and so I think, you know, when codes are written like that, um, they try to do their best, but they're not perfect. And uh, we have to think about functionality. And so we, we try to do our best to make it functional and, and reasonable here. <clears throat> Uh, the floor area ratio, you know, we talked about that. It's, it's extremely difficult, um, marketable to put a two-story building on here and expect a tenant to be successful. It's just not an area where you would see those type of tenants have success. Um, and so we knew that from our market analysis that that probably wouldn't work. We could build it, but really it doesn't do us any good to sit there vacant. Um, and so we are asking for that reduction. Um, and also the important thing is the parking issues. We are, we fought this site from the beginning with parking and we tried to maximize and again, we if we if we went another two stories, we'd probably have to have five or six more stalls. And you can see we've maximized and pushed every every little inch of this of this site. <clears throat> The 15-foot landscape buff buffer I find is, is very interesting um, considering the fact that they would like our building 10 feet away from the property line. But I do want to point out that the dashed line, sorry, I don't know. So there's a dashed line right there. That's our actual property line. And then you'll see there's another green strip right there. That's ODOT right-of-way. So I don't know exactly how big that is, Scott. I don't know if you know the right of way size, but it's probably eight or ten feet, um, and we will landscape that and maintain that, and so we really will be fairly close to the 15 feet. In reality, ODOT will obviously have the right to do something with that in the future if they so choose. Um, also on landscaping, I do want to point out that we offer to the city. There's the city has this whole area here. It's about a 30 foot right of way from the old 99 highway. Um, and if you drive by it recently, you'll see it's about four feet of weeds. Um, but we've offered to also uh, landscape that as part of our development and maintain that um, until the city needs it for anything in the future. So that would be part of it. We're not counting that as part of our landscape, but we will improve that area and take care of it long term. <clears throat> I think that's all I have. I'll be happy to ask you any questions. Is the landscaping irrigated? Yes, sir. Yeah, we do have the plan. I don't. I, th I think you have a, the plan in your um, packet, but uh, they are drought-resistant um, type plantings. But it will be irrigated. Yes. Just out of curiosity, does this look like the building where Dr. Visser is? Is it the um, design kind of similar? Somewhat. It'll be a little bit different, but somewhat, yes. Yeah. Good comparison. I saw the plans for the drive through I was thinking, what other coffee shop could we possibly put in? <laughs> and, and so uh, I'm thankful we're not getting it on the <laughs> Not in the plans. Not that's, in the plans. That's not going to happen. Pizza? Pizza's, Pizza's good. good. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Any other proponents? <coughs> Any opponents? Anybody that's feeling fairly neutral today? Okay. Who's neutral about pizza? No one's neutral about pizza <laughs> unless it's you know, vegetarian pizza. It's not real pizza. Okay, so at this time I'll close the public testimony. Um, so if we have any, any more questions, you know, anybody? So uh, we'll move on to the discussion portion of this. Anybody have any thoughts on, on this at all? I might, um, if you don't mind, I might explain, now that I've been sitting here thinking about that 15-foot landscape, I'm thinking that its requirement is to try to, because just as uh, 
as uh, our applicant had mentioned, you've got a requirement to build the building within 10 feet, but then they want 15 foot landscaping. It's not really a direct. What they're trying to get after is to move your parking to the side or rear. They want to see the building, not a parking lot in front of the building. And so that's where that landscaping requirement came from, I believe. And so we're, we don't have a parking lot in front of the building in this, this instance. We do have a maneuvering drive, though, and so they're thinking of either of those as being what was undesirable in terms of what they were trying to achieve. Okay. Thank you. Derek, you have any? I don't. Mm -hmm. okay. no. John? John? No, no you're good. I'm you're good. Everybody's good? I'm okay. good. And I will entertain a motion to um, to approve the uh, request for site design for DR 16-03 for Mr. Tom Scott. Mr. Chair, I make a motion to approve DR 16-03 for Mr. Tom Scott. Do I have a second? I second. Moved in, um, <clears throat> That's with the modification, five modifications that it that mentioned in the... Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? There you go. Thank you very much. Oh no, those have to stay. Yep. <laughs> it becomes part of the artwork. <laughs> okay, we will uh, we will uh, consider a consider a request for a six lot subdivision suitable for single family dwellings. That would be um, uh, SUB 16-02 for Mr. Charlie Clark. I will once again read the uh, hearing script. The matter presently before the hearing body requires a public hearing. All interested persons in attendance shall be heard on the matter. If you wish to testify on this matter, please be prepared to step forward to the microphone at the appropriate time. State your name, email <coughs> address, and interest in the matter. For those people other than the applicants that are interested in testifying as either proponents or opponents, please sign in on the sheet or speak up when we call for testimony. For longer presentations, proponents and opponents may buy time from one another. In so doing, those either in favor or opposed may allocate their time to a spokesperson who will represent the entire group. You may be limited by time for your presentation. Generally, the applicant will have a total of 15 minutes to speak. The proponents will be given five minutes each. The opponents will be given five minutes each. And those thought to be neutral on the matter will be given five minutes each. The applicant will then have 10 minutes for a rebuttal. All questions must be directed through the chair. Any evidence to be considered must be submitted to the hearing body for public access and to become a part of the record. All written testimony received both for and against prior to the hearing shall be summarized by staff and presented briefly to the hearing body during the staff report. Testimony and evidence must be directed toward the applicable review criteria contained as indicated in the staff report. A comprehensive plan of the applicable land use regulations which the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals based on that issue. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government to respond to the issue may preclude an action for damages in circuit court. Everyone present is encouraged to testify even if it is only to concur with the previous testimony. At this time, I would ask that any member of the hearing body who has a conflict of interest to please indicate the nature and extent of the conflict and whether you intend to participate in or abstain from the hearing from hearing the present matter. 
Understood. Also, if any member of the hearing body has had any ex parte contact with anyone prior to this hearing, including a visit to the site, please declare the nature and extent of such contact at this time. Okay. Does any member of the audience have any questions for any commissioner regarding conflict of interest or ex parte contact? Okay. Uh, the public hearing will be conducted uh, as follows. First of all, the staff report, and then any questions from us. Uh, then the applicant, uh, not more than 15 minutes. Proponents, not more than five minutes each.